I'm going to discuss five aspects of school readiness with you in this video. Now, if you go and have a look, you'll probably find long lists of things to check to see whether your child is school ready. But in my mind, these are the five most important things to, to look out for. The first is bilateral integration. Now, bilateral integration really just means the ability to use the two sides of your body in a coordinated way. For instance, when you're walking, you need both your right and your left leg to be working together so that you don't fall over and so that you move forward. Now, crossing the midline is a very important element of bilateral integration. And basically, if you were to imagine a line running straight from the top of your head all the way through the midline of your body right in between your big toes that is what we talk about as being the midline now crossing the midline just basically means that you're able to cross one side of your body over onto the other side we use this ability every day even though we're not really aware of it everything you do for instance when you want to draw a horizontal line across a page when you are putting on a sock, you're using both sides of your body together and you're crossing that midline. Now, some child, children find it very difficult to do this. For instance, if they're drawing horizontal line, you might find that they actually use the left hand up into the midpoint and then swap the pencil over to the right hand and continue drawing from there. It has all sorts of implications because if you're having difficulty crossing the midline, it might also mean that you are perhaps not going to establish hand dominance. So choose a hand that you actually write with most of the time. You might not be able to work horizontally across a page from left to right. And remember that it's not just about the, the hands, it might also have to do with the eyes. So you might not be able to read from left to right using both eyes together. Some very simple ways in which you can encourage your child to, to cross the midline is for instance, when they're playing on the carpet or lying down on the floor, try and have them lie on one arm because the minute that one arm is behind the head or supporting the head, they'll naturally have to cross over to get to the other side with their cars or their dolls or whatever toys they're playing with. You could also stick a really nice big piece of cardboard, a big piece of butcher's paper onto a wall and then have your child draw what we call lazy eights. So it's basically just an eight lying horizontally on its side and just continually do that to cross the midline. Lots of games like Twister or Simon Says are very good for bilateral integration and crossing the midline or even having your child sit in a circle with other children and passing along a big parcel or a big ball is also good for that. Things like crawling or even wheelbarrow races where they're on their hands and you lift up their legs, that's very good for, for crossing the midline. And maybe even take old, some old pots, some pans, have them drum on them and they'll be having so much fun they'll completely forget or won't even realize that they're working on it. Or just a simple thing such as having your, your child sitting cross-legged on the floor is also very helpful in this regard. The second aspect is fine motor control. And as part of my school readiness assessment, we always have a look at fine motor control and pencil grip. And very often the question comes up, parents will say to me, so my child doesn't have a great pencil grip, is it really such a big thing? And inevitably I hear a story about some brilliant doctor or someone who does very well academically but still has an awful pencil grip. But the truth is, is that it does make a difference and this is why. When you're holding your pencil in a tripod pencil grip, what we call the dynamic tripod pencil grip, you'll see that I only need to use my fingers in order to be able to write. The minute you use a different kind of grip, like when you have a fist grip or you put all the fingers onto the pencil or you wrap your thumb over or under, that becomes quite a static grip. The fingers are all very stiff. And so instead of being able to use your fingers to write, you're now using your entire arm to write. So it's all about the energy that you're expanding. And of course, you've got less control when you do this than when you just use the little muscles in the fingers. The problem here is that quite often within the primary school, children don't do huge amounts of writing. So when they have an ineffective pencil grip, it might have an effect on their control, but we don't always often notice the effect it has on their writing speed. It definitely will slow them down. And 
the problem is that we only really start noticing this in the high school stage. So high school teachers will start saying he's not keeping up with note taking, he's not finishing exams in the time. And the problem is that by then it's a little bit late to try and make a difference to that pencil grip because by then it's become an, a habit. It's easiest to try and change the pencil grip in the foundation phase. So before the child turns nine or ten. That is why most teachers will push in the beginning and in the foundation phase if they feel that your child doesn't have an effective pencil grasp. So one of the easiest ways to try and sort it out is occupational therapy. That's usually quite effective for, for pencil grasp. Or alternatively, if you want to try and just deal with it at home, you get wonderful tripod pencils, which are actually triangular, that automatically molds the fingers into the right position or something called a pencil grip that you put onto your pencil and that's a little rubber thing that also molds the fingers into the right space. If you find that you try everything and you just can't get your child to change that pencil grip, they still use the old grip, what you might want to do is just focus on their handwriting speed. So give them something to copy for instance and see whether they can copy more within the same amount of time or whether you can give them less and less time every day for them to finish copying that task. If you try that as well and it doesn't help to increase the speed, all is still not lost. We often find that by the time children start writing exams, if they're particularly slow with their handwriting, we are allowed to apply for extra time for them during tests and exams. Just while we're talking, even though it's not strictly pencil grip, I'd also just have to have a quick look at the pressure with which children write and hold their pencil. So generally, when a child is putting too much pressure onto the page or not enough pressure onto the pencil and, and onto the page, that is related to sensory input and proprioception. So an idea of where the hand and the arm is in relation to everything else. And when they put too much pressure onto the pencil, we find that they might keep tearing the page or the handwriting might be really dark and smudged. And of course, when they write too lightly, it's difficult to read. Very easy way to try and help them if they put on too much pressure is to give them a clutch pencil. Because the lead is quite thin, it will break as soon as you apply too much pressure. So that teaches children to, to apply less pressure. Or you can play a game that we call secret messages. So what we do is get the child to try and write lightly enough so that they can completely erase what they've written with an eraser. And if the adult or their friend can still read what they've written, they lose and the friend wins. Also, if for instance, if the pressure is too light, what we sometimes find helps is to actually put sandpaper underneath the page because that will automatically provide input to how much pressure the child is putting on. Or you get wonderful uh, weighted pencils, but they can be quite expensive. So what works quite effectively sometimes is to put rubber bands around the pencil with washers just to weigh down that pencil a little bit and that provides the sensory input that a child needs. If we have a look at fine motor control, which is really where pencil grip plays such an important role, fine motor has to do with all the little muscles within the hands and the wrists and the fingers. And it's super important for completing important work like cutting, writing, drawing, typing and doing that all effectively and with good control so that it requires minimal conscious effort and just happens automatically. Fine motor control is always a fun thing to try and try and work on and to try and exercise. Some of the things you can do for instance is to maybe collect all the shoelaces in the house and have your child tie them in all sorts of intricate knots and once it's all tied get them to untie everything and lace the shoes back up again. Activities like beading or knitting or even cross stitch are not only for girls, very good for boys as well for those fine motor muscles. You can play games like pick up sticks and marbles, darts, yo-yos, spinning tops, even thumb wars will exercise those muscles. Get them to shred newspaper, pop bubble wrap. Really good idea is to just give them an old keyboard, give them an old cell phone that will also exercise those little muscles or something like finger paint where they can really just let their creative juices flow. Another aspect is shape recognition. 
often overlooked, I think, and shape recognition is the basis on which a lot of mathematical concepts as well as learning to read is based. So for instance, if you can't remember what a triangle looks like, you're going to battle to recognize and remember the capital letter A. The same with a circle, which is so important for letters like O, for a small letter A. And often the problem lies more in actually remembering the name of the shape than what it looks like. So a lot of kids, for instance, can't remember, if they, we point out different shapes, they can't remember that the shape is called a triangle. But if I had to say to them, can you show me the triangle, they can point it out. Repeated exposure really is the key to, to shape recognition. And the more times you can point out shapes everywhere you go, in magazines, the street signs, ask your child to collect all things that are circular in the house, that will help to just solidify that, that concept. Then I'd like to look at auditory and visual perception. Now, auditory and visual perception are very in-depth subjects, but basically auditory perception has to do with the way that the brain interprets what it hears. Even though the ears might be working fine, the brain might not be interpreting that information correctly. Similar with visual discrimination or visual perception that has to do with the way that the brain interprets the information it gets from the eyes. So what I'm going to focus on specifically here is the specific aspects of auditory and visual perception that have to do with early literacy skills. So for instance, one of the most important things would be auditory discrimination, being able to hear the differences in sounds. When you're sitting in the car, say two sounds and ask your child to tell you whether they are the same or not. For instance, b, d, is that the same? Toast, coast, are they the same words? Also, when we are introducing early sounds, to get that discrimination to be nice and clear, you might play games like I spy, for instance, where you'll say to your child, I can see something in the room that's red that starts with a b or that starts with a d. Never use the letter names, not a, b, c, a, b, d. We like to play the clapping game and that's again auditory perception and it has to do with syllabification. So being able to break words up into specific syllables, so important for spelling later on. And we do that by playing the clapping game. So what we'll do is we'll basically give the child a word and say, can you break it up by clapping? Words like spider man, elephant, to hear where those syllables are. In terms of auditory closure, so that has to do with if, for instance, your child is sitting in the classroom and he doesn't hear, the teacher might be talking and turning her head, so he doesn't hear exactly all the words she's saying, can he still summarize what the end of those, can he know what the teacher was saying and guess what the end of those words are? Auditory analysis and synthesis basically has to do with breaking up words by their sounds, or if I'm given sounds, can I put them together in a word? And again, really nice game to play in the car. You can say to your child, k at makes, and have them tell you what, what word they hear. Visual analysis and synthesis is very similar, so that has to do with looking at a word and being able to break them up. Very important for spelling and knowing which letters to put in. And again, that analysis of when I see all these letters together, that forms one unit, which is a word. It's important to focus on spatial orientation as well. So if you think about reading, Many of us just take it for granted, but when you're first learning to read, it's a very complicated story. We read from left to right, you've got all these letters together that makes a word, but that's separate from the next bunch of letters that make another word. And then we're also reading from the top to the bottom. So difficult sometimes for children to orientate themselves and to know exactly where they should be on the page and which words they should be reading together. Very important then to practice those concepts, things like under, next to, above, on top of, in front of each other. And you can do that very easily with everyday objects. For instance, you can take a pillow and say, put it on top of your head, put it behind you, put it in front of you, just so that they can learn that concept. 
You can enhance your child's sequencing skills, which again has to do with which letters come next to each other, by simple games, things like beading different beads onto a string in a specific sequence. Lego is great for that. You know, give them a little, build something with Lego and ask them to copy exactly what you've done. And then lastly is rhyme. Now rhyme again, luckily we do lots of nursery rhymes with our little ones when they're tiny. Rhyme is so important for children to hear what we call word families. So for instance, if I know that sat, cat, mat, rat all end with the same two letters, all I need to concern myself about is that first letter of the word and that makes it much easier to learn to read. The last aspect I'd like to look at is emotional readiness. And Basically, there's a lot of confusion about what we mean when we talk about emotional school readiness. But very shortly, it means that a child is confident enough to speak up if they're uncomfortable, that they're independent enough to work on their own, so that the teacher doesn't have to come and see what they're doing all the time. It means they can separate easily from their parents without being emotional and upset when the parent leaves. It means they can sort out minor conflicts with their peers. Of course, it's totally normal for the teacher to still get involved with big conflicts, but at least little things they can sort out on their own. It means that they can concentrate for long enough. It means that they'll persist with challenging tasks, so they won't just give up too easily if something is difficult. And it means that they'll take some responsibility for their own belongings, so the teacher's not constantly having to check that they've got everything they need.